Hello. Just over a year ago, I made a video stating that I was going to build an adapter board for the Mister to allow you to connect a floppy drive. Well, today I thought I'd give you an exciting update. I left my previous video showing designs of my first prototype boards. So let's have a look and then I'll bring you up to date. So I started off with this PCB and straight away I discovered a fault, hence the bodge wire. So I made a few changes and tried to order the next version. This version had the previous design fixed, so I didn't need that bodge wire anymore. But when I tried to order it, chip U4 was unavailable. Not to worry, I could buy them locally, or so I thought. By the time they arrived, I couldn't get that chip anywhere, so I designed a version using through-hole components. The best part about these is they're really easy to solder up, so you can make one easily. It's so easy. Here's me happily assembling it, eager to use it and test it. And here we have this version fully built. Whilst waiting for these boards to arrive, I'd been learning Verilog, the language used by the Minimig core. And if you've programmed before, you may find the code looks a little bit familiar, but it doesn't really behave the same. So anyway, back to that prototype board. The large chip you can see is a 16 channel port expander. And the reason we need this is because if you look at the pinout of the floppy drive, both the IBM PC drive and the Sugart drive used in the Amiga, you can actually see the 17 pins defined. Now I want to make sure this can potentially support the full range of four drives on the Sugart side. So we need all of the pins and this is where the project becomes tricky. In an ideal world, we'd just free up some pins and connect everything up, but this needs to stay compatible with the Mister's standard user port. Now the Mister's user port, the one that looks like a USB 3 connector, only has seven IO lines that we can use, so we need to be careful. The port expander doesn't give instant access to the signals, read or written, but it does use two pins for the I2C communication, so that actually only leaves us with five IO lines. Looking at the signals from the drive, the signals that would change the fastest would be the read and write data lines. So these two have to have their own pins. It's just not going to work if they don't. Along with data writing, the control for when writing is actually allowed will need to be precisely controlled too. So the write gate also needs to be present here. Some games and applications need to time the readings from the index marker. So I guess that needs to be here as well. And that leaves us with the last pin. My choice here is based on whilst reading a disc, the surface being read may actually change very quickly. So that's all of the pins used up. The rest will have to make their way onto the port expander. And the reason why this shouldn't be a problem is because, well, starting with step and direction, when the step signal is pulsed, the drive is allowed a certain amount of time to actually settle at the new position, roughly around three milliseconds. Well, we can transmit at the speed of microseconds, so that's not gonna be a problem. These pins are reading data from the drive and they're all typically queried after a step operation. So long as I can pull the data from them quickly enough, this shouldn't be an issue either. The next pin to look at is the motor pin. Well, typically after switching on the motor, the drive requires around 500 milliseconds to get up to speed. So that's much slower than the speed we're going. Ignoring the in use pin, this leaves us with drive selection. And for the most part, this shouldn't be an issue either as it's got to be set before the use of any of the other pins. So long as the sequence of pin changes stays the same and in order, we should be good. Now this leaves quite a fair few pins free on the port expander, and I can use them for some extra things. For example, I've assigned one to allow you to choose between an IBM and a Sugart drive. I've assigned another one to be an activity indicator for the drive. I've assigned a third one for a reset signal which can typically be found on the Amiga's external floppy drive connector. And finally, I've assigned another one for the MTRX line. Now this is a special motor line specifically for the Amiga and it's only present on that external connector. Now with all good prototypes, nothing stays the same and it became obvious as I started writing code that the way I'd connected the various pins to the port expander wasn't very efficient. The port expander splits 16 pins into two banks of eight. You can optionally write to one or write to both or read from one or read from both, but I'd randomly assigned the pins based on how they fitted on the PCB, meaning that I've got input and output signals mixed between the two. This means that if I was just reading the data, then I was actually having to read twice as much data than I actually needed. The same going with writing, I was writing twice as much than I needed. So I rewired all of the connections to put all of the output pins in the first bank and the remaining input pins in the second. I'd been experimenting with the board using this strange setup. The idea here was to use the Amiga's external drive, hook it up to an Arduino which could interpret all of the signals either side and relay them along the test user port. And amazingly this worked. The Amiga was able to access the disk. Well, sort of, but it was enough for a proof of concept anyway. For now I was content with carrying on with this modded board and I started to make a little bit of progress. And luckily after the announcement of the previous video I had a few people join me to help. One of them, going by the name Lukage, supplied me with some code he'd written when attempting to produce a similar product. 
This was a great starting point. It showed me where I needed to look in the code. And when you're talking about code describing the entire computer's hardware, then you imagine there's probably quite a bit of code. Some of that code, provided, is still present right now. It was at this point that I celebrated the first milestone. The Mr. Minimig core was controlling the drive and produced that famous click sound. Waiting for a disc. It didn't do anything when I inserted a disc, but it was a start. Nothing is ever that simple, however. When I finally did get it recognising a disc being inserted, the drive just went crazy. Eventually I got it stable and I was able to get a disc inserted to behave properly and with the help of the code provided by Lukage, I managed to get my favourite go-to boot disc booting. Amazing! This worked fine for IBM drives but when I switched the interface to the Sugar type of drive the whole thing went crazy again and it was related to the previous crazy problem. This is the I2C data coming into the port expander and I know the cause although I haven't figured out how to fix it yet. This doesn't matter however, as I've changed the pins from the port expander such that the problematic pin is now only triggered when using drive 3. Are you really going to use 4 drives? Someday I'll fix this though. It was at this point I decided I wanted to try something non-DOS, so I tried Dungeon Master. Now for Dungeon Master to boot it requires the PLL part of Paula to be implemented perfectly, and hats off to Lukage, this bit was spot on and the game booted. The same can't be said however for Lemmings or Captain Planet. Now I knew physically how this copy protection worked and it was all based around timings and it took me a long time to figure out why it wasn't working and what was going on here. The Amiga has a special register called Disk Byte R and generally it's not used all that much. The lowest byte, bits 0 to 7, store the last byte of MFM data read from the floppy drive. When a new byte is ready, the Disk Byte bit is set to 1 and it's reset back to 0 when you read this register. DMA on is set when the Disk DMA is active as far as I can tell. Disk write is one when the drive is actually writing to the disk. And finally, word equal is set when the disk sync register exactly matches the incoming data, and only during that MFM bit, and this could be as little as 2 microseconds. Now the problem with this register is that the Minimig core doesn't actually implement these bits correctly, or for some of them not at all. All of the games loaded on the Minimig core are normally ADFs, i.e. with no copy protection because they've been cracked. So this doesn't matter, but for us, using real disks, it's a big deal. It took quite a while to figure out the correct way to implement this enough for the games like Lemmings to play. After a lot of debugging, I finally managed to implement the missing fields correctly and Lemmings booted too. I ended up using WinUAE as a reference for what happens to this register during load. And I monitored it to make sure this register was behaving the same. The thing I really like about this is the drive sounds exactly how it does on the real Amiga when a game is loading. Now this change to the register is currently only for external real disks and not for ADFs, more on that later. Now a test with another game, Captain Planet. And I know you'll laugh, but the copy protection on this game seems to be a little bit stronger than Lemmings. Honestly, why did they bother? Anyone that was lucky enough to get the Cartoon Classics pack will no doubt have a little bit of nostalgia for this game though. At this point I celebrated and decided to order some new PCBs with the revised pinout instead of using the one with all those mod wires. And here it is, in lovely purple. I figured out I didn't need the second chip used as a buffer, so I removed it. I also added some extra capacitors for decoupling and stability caused by power fluctuations when the floppy drive motors activate. I was also a little annoyed that I hadn't noticed the strange power LED placement. So I fixed that and ordered another batch, which I threw in the bin almost straight away as I had a really neat idea. When the user port first appeared on the mister, it only actually had 6 IO lines, not 7. When the extra line was added, a jumper was added too, called IO6 or SW7 on the multi-system. This jumper allows you to toggle between the 3.3 volts and the extra IO line for backward compatibility. Whilst waiting for these boards to arrive, I decided to make use of this and move right gate to pin IO6. This means if you absolutely want to prevent writing to any disk, simply set this jumper or switch to 3.3 volts. Such a simple but great hack. Up to this point, I'd only been testing with one drive, and most likely that's all anyone will use, but I wanted to see what happened if I added a second. And this is where things started to go a little bit wrong. Those select signals that I thought were perfectly fine now came back to bite me. For moving the drive head around etc it's not a problem, but reading and writing data those lines are set and expected to have been set instantly. But they're not, as we have to wait for the port expander to update. Now I've patched around the reading, that's fine, and anyone who decides to add support for this into their core can easily do that too. Writing on the other hand, well this is going to be a bit more tricky and I may have to get a little bit hacky, and this is unavoidable due to the limitations of the number of pins available. 
Oh well, that's a job for another day though. There was another more important task that I needed to do. The main menu in the mister. Up until now I'd hard coded the drive into the code and whilst it was great for me, in the long term this isn't such a good idea. So I needed to be able to select from this main menu. The main menu code actually resides in another project and it's written in C++. And with Lukic's code for reference, it was easy to modify and with a few changes I can now select exactly what drive I want to be external. And you can even select this while the core is running, although I don't recommend doing that. So what now? Well, I've just made up the latest prototype and it works great. And I've even built an experimental floppy drive slice for the Mr. Multisystem too. I also have a different design in mind, but this looks kind of smart, doesn't it? Although it needs a case badge, which means it needs a logo. Anyone out there willing to design a smart, clean logo? Oh, and I forgot to mention, I'm officially calling this Mr. Floppy. But there's still more work to do. I want to fix that writing issue and I have a few other ideas too such as seeing if I can get files like SCP and IPF working, so we don't have to play crack games anymore. Eventually, when I'm 100% happy with this, the whole project will go open source, and who knows, maybe it'll become part of the official build. But for now, if you want to follow the progress of this project, and possibly get an early version of the PCB up and running, then you'll have to find me on Patreon, and I'm very very thankful for that support. This is really only for early beta testing though. I hope you found this update interesting, and maybe even exciting. I'll keep you posted on updates, so if you don't want to miss out, hit that subscribe button below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.